Okay, so a very warm welcome to this session entitled Integration in the Real World of Care. Um, as we know, end-of-life care doesn't occur in one place. Patients and their families move fairly flexibly across geographical and organisational settings. So it's really nice to have four speakers from four different disciplines to talk to us today, or four different types of services. My name is Lynn Bassett. I'm really pleased to be chairing this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to move to our first speaker, who is Sharon Blackburn, CBE, and she's Policy and Communication Director for the National Care Forum. And Sharon's going to talk about how to be the change that we want to see. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you. I'm going to buck the trends. I'm not using any PowerPoint. I, I sort of thought I'd, it would just, we'd have a conversation together. Um, my background is I'm a nurse and 38 years as a nurse, but I've worked 28 years in adult social care in a variety of roles. And um, I just want to have a conversation with you this afternoon about the importance of integration and perhaps from a, a number of different perspectives in the, in the time allowed. And somebody grabbed me earlier today, which was very nice, in a nice way, and said, it's really good to see somebody from social care here, but why? <laughs> and I would say, well, why not? But I, I just want to... In my presentation, I just want to share with you some statistics that hopefully if you know them, they will reinforce your knowledge. And if they are new, then hopefully it will help build the picture about why integration is important. And also, having just listened to Jane, Jane Bakewell, that um, some of the things that she says, I think has resonance for our conversation and for some of the things I want to share. When we talk about adult social care, it covers not just care homes, both with and without nursing, it covers home care, and it also covers a range of housing with care and support. It isn't just for older people, although those are the largest client group. It is also for adults. And we talk now not just about old people, but also the very old, and Joan alluded to that in her talk. She also alluded to an important fact that actually we don't, don't just have an ageing population, we have an ageing workforce. Anybody that was alert to the announcements in the budget yesterday will know that there hasn't been any funding put into social care in the Chancellor's announcements. And in my personal opinion and the opinion of the association I work for, that's quite short-sighted in the round if you look at it from the perspective of people who use services. So in terms of if I look at the care home population in particular uh, for the purpose of this talk, because I think it gives us a really good starting point, I don't know if you know, but there are 450,000 places for people residing in care homes for older people. The, that's three times the number of beds within the NHS. We have a workforce that is bigger than the NHS. It's 1.5 million people of which 43,000 are registered nurses. Now, the statistics very rarely get presented in that way because we're not one group. Social care is a marketplace made up of uh, for-profit providers and not-for-profit care providers. And there's only about 4% of provision that is still in the public domain, so operated by either health or local authorities. That raises concerns within some people's thinking um, and actually, it puts barriers in place for engagement. So why do we need integration? What is, why is it so topical all of a sudden? Is it just a new topic, or is it something that we've spoken about for many years? I would argue that it's something that we've spoken about for a long time, and we've got numerous policies, documents, saying why it's important. More importantly, in recent years, what we have harnessed and uh, galvanized is the voice of the person using the service and those of their loved ones. And anybody who read the Choice Review, 
um, that was a ministerial review around end-of-life care or has been involved with any work by Think Local Act Personal, or even if those who are nurses in the room have read Leading Change Adding Value, particularly the section on social care, you will see that we've routinely used a number of I statements. And those I statements aren't professionalised statements. They are statements from people who use services. And those statements talk about having choice, voice and control. They are statements that say that they want access to um, appropriate information at the right time. They want to be informed and included in the decisions that matter to them. They don't expect there to be a bottomless purse, but they do expect there to be an honest conversation about what is available and what isn't available. People living in care homes, the average age of entry to a care home now is age 85 plus. People living in a care home typically have four or more long-term conditions. And typically, up to 90% of people can have a cognitive impairment, with about 40 or 50% experiencing and having been given a formal diagnosis of dementia. Because people are staying and living in the community longer, we find that when people enter a care home, uh, that the average length of stay is 9 to 18 months. So the bulk of business, if you like, the bulk of care that is delivered, and I don't use business in a, a horrid way, seeing people as a commodity, um, but I, the bulk of activity that takes place in terms of the relationships and the care that is delivered is at that end of life stage. It's helping people when they come into a care home to maximize living to its, its full potential, but it's also about helping people to live and die well. But people who work in care homes can't be experts in every field. When people move into a care home, they move, uh, they've changed their address. So they're still entitled to all the services that you and I enjoy in our own homes. All they've done is change the number on their front door, perhaps the street name. They may have changed town to move closer to their families. And we know from the last question and the last session is that there is an ageing workforce. So we know that there's restricted funds and the Chancellor hasn't put any more money into the pot. And we know that integration is good because we know from the perspective of people using services that actually it's a jigsaw made up of loads of pieces and actually it never gets joined up. And we know from people and hearing their stories that often they have to go through multiple assessments. I was told yesterday, I was at the BGS conference yesterday and somebody came up to me and they said they were currently looking after somebody with 13 care plans. 13 individual care plans. I hear from professionals who they themselves are carers telling me, I'm a professional, I work in this sector and I don't know how to navigate it for my loved one. I don't know how to access the care and support I need for them. I don't know this complex world where health is free at the point of delivery and social care is means tested. I don't understand when we're still talking about a medical bath and a social bath, or we're talking about dementia being, is it a medical condition or is it a social care condition? These are people's lives. And more importantly, when people come to the end of their life, for them and their loved ones dying with dignity and being able to die the death they want to die and having choice and control, however limited that may become in those latter days, is important that you and I begin to have conversations. We need to stand where people stand. So at this point, I normally say and ask a question for a show of hands, and I will ask, how many people in this room take medication? I took medication this morning. Okay. I wonder, I don't need a show of hands, but I wonder how many people in this audience have a long-term condition. And I wonder how many people in this room are carers for loved ones, be them young or old or somewhere in between. Yeah, hands are going up. Thank you for being honest. I didn't... So this isn't about them. This is about us. And... If we continue to perpetuate the silos that we all work in and don't understand life from the perspective of people who use services and just say the I statements as a mantra, 
if we just perpetuate and do that which we've always done, trying to stretch the envelope rather than look more creatively at what can be done in the envelope, we will get more of what we've got. And we know that that isn't sustainable and isn't always good for people who use services. So we have to get together and think what we can do within that envelope, open the envelope out and think, how do we occupy that space? What conversations do we need to have? How do we broker them? And what can we do differently? Where can we retain our professional and regulatory and legislative integrities? But actually, what things can we let go of? I had a conversation with somebody yesterday, and it just really stuck, so I'm going to share it with you. And it was about, about the 80-20 rule. Now, we normally say, you know, you've got 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. But it wasn't about that. It was about... 80% of the work that we are engaged in can actually be done by a range of people, but all of us tend to hold on to the 80% rather than looking at where our skills, knowledge and expertise can be most valuably utilised. And often if we look at that, we can determine what the 80% is and actually think about how do we share that? How can we get that into a more generic capacity and determine who will do that so that actually we can put our efforts and our specialist knowledge and skills into the 20%? And it's just got me thinking, I don't have an answer. I'm not standing here thinking I've worked it all through in the last 24 hours, because I haven't. But it gave me food for thought about how we collectively, in our localities, up close and personal, the people that you work with and then you engage with, how we can do things differently. Care homes in particular, and I would extend this to home care, but there is knowledge and expertise in those care homes. It won't be the same as yours. It may not be to the same level. And just with all services, in adult social care, there will be many variables. Some will be at the outstanding end, and some will be at that end where there's need for improvement. Assuming you know what they need without asking what they need is actually a real put-off. It gets people's backs up instead of saying, how can we work together? What would you like from us? How could we best serve you? And how can they best serve you? So, sort of, so that it's reciprocal. So that you get the best from each other's skills and utilize the knowledge and expertise and access the right services for the right people at the right time in the right amount with the right skills. Knowing when to put in and with to draw, when to withdraw. But the important thing to integration and going forward is relationships, taking off our roles and responsibilities and understanding where each other are coming from, building trust. It's good to talk, we're told. And I guess in the many people in this room, it's something that we're fairly good at because it's why we're in the profession of caring. We talk with people, we engage, we get really detailed and sensitive and personal information from people. But how are we doing with each other across the professions? Are we in protection mode where we're protecting the boundaries of our profession, be it nursing, be it some other profession represented in this room, presenting our organisations? Or are we willing to give and put down some of those boundaries? I think we have to for sustainability. I think we've got to adopt and adapt. I think we've got to be brave and ask that question, what matters to you, not what's the matter? And apply it not just to the people we serve and care for, but to each other. So do you know what you want, what you really, really want? Do you know the change that you want to see? And I want to ask you, are you prepared to be the change? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sharon. That was most stimulating. Um, final question. We're going to take questions at the end, but now we'll move swiftly on to our next speaker, who is Shamila Data, and she's end-of-life care lead, and she's a specialist paramedic, working with the South East Coast Ambulance Service, NHS Foundation Trust. So another perspective. Shamila. Um, hi everyone, uh, this is my first proper conference, so please bear that in mind with me. Um, I'm Shamila, um, 
I'm a specialist paramedic in urgent and emergency care. Uh, I work in South East Coast Ambulance Service, which covers the whole of Kent, Surrey and Sussex. So to give you an idea, that's a population of about four and a half million. Um, there's 22 CCGs within that and around 15 hospices and we have around 3,000 frontline staff within that area. I have been working as the single end-of-life care lead across that patch for the last two and a half years. I'm just going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing. So, first of all, because I know that probably none of you here are from the ambulance service, I just want to give you some context, put you into the mindset of what it's like to be a paramedic or an ambulance clinician who's going out to this end-of-life care group of patients. So, a job that I went to... Um, a few years ago now, um, probably about three years ago, uh, I was 13 hours into a 12-hour shift, um, lone working, it was a night shift, and it was about seven in the morning. I found myself sitting in the living room of a 40-year-old woman, and I was breaking the bad news to her that her husband had died, despite our efforts to resuscitate him. And this isn't an end-of-life care example. He wasn't expected to die. This was an unexpected death. And I remember being sat there, breaking the bad news, and I've never formally, I had never been formally taught how to break bad news. And I looked down at my knees at one point, and I remember thinking, why are my knees wet? There's, my knees are soaking wet, and I can't figure out why. And I was thinking about it whilst I was consoling her, and I realised that I had amniotic fluid on my knees because not one hour before, I delivered a baby in the back of a traveller caravan um, on my own with no midwife. This is the mindset change that we're dealing with in the ambulance service. This is what people are trying to sort of manage when they go to your patients who are naturally dying. Just think about, if you take nothing else from today, from me, just think about what those people who are managing your patients might have been dealing with just before. It might have been delivering a baby. It might have been trying to prevent the death of somebody who was dying completely unnaturally. And just consider that. So... What do the ambulance services have to do with end-of-life care anyway? There is some research around why this group of patients call 999. Um, and it's not necessarily calling 999. It might be through 111, and, and certainly not them calling. It might be their families. And those reasons will include things like transfers, as you would expect, from hospice to home, home to hospice, social crisis, family care breakdown, previously unrecognised dying process, particularly in the non-cancer patients, and distressing symptoms that are really concerning for the family. I think the other thing we need to think about is in that whole last year of life, falls, exacerbations, they're the things that we're being called out to. One study said that an ambulance clinician went to one patient a day who was end of life, but that study defined it by actively dying patients. When I teach, and I've taught a lot in the ambulance service, the staff that I know, when I show them the GSF criteria, they think it's 80% of their patients. And in my opinion, we're probably pretty much an end-of-life care ambulance service in this country. So what is our role in end-of-life care? And I think it probably covers these things here. Care and compassion, holistic care and advocacy, palliative care, care of the family and communication, upholding the wishes and managing death. And I think this comes both from a patient-by-patient -patient basis when we're with those, individual, those individuals who are dying, but also from a strategic level and by integrating with other services from across the system ensuring that our staff and the staff we're working with are educated and empowered to help these patients. So a little bit about the national view. 
end-of-life care education was only added to the paramedic curriculum last year. Until last year, any paramedics, well, even now, the ones that are qualifying, any paramedics will have had completely unstandardised education, if any, in end-of-life care. And most only get what they, they seek out. So this inevitably leads to real inconsistency across managing these patients and in every way in confidence and actual skill. There's not much research in paramedicine. It's, it's developing quite a lot with the profession. Um, there's been massive changes in the profession over the last even 10 years. And some of the main concerns that staff have shown is that they are fearful they are fearful of litigation, they're fearful of being persecuted by their trust for making good decisions, and they lack confidence in knowledge and skills around end-of-life care, particularly around evaluating best interests and the influence of others on their decision-making, so, you know, families that are struggling. Also, they, doc they documented the positive impact of access to information about patients' wishes and patients' views and shared decision-making. Because, remember, if you're going in to this patient, we, we often don't even know their name before we go in. And then trying to make complex decisions that normally would take an entire care team to make at three in the morning on your own it can be impossible without that information. In the update of our JR Calc guidelines, which is the Joint Royal College Ambulance Liaison Committee practice guidelines, the end of life care section was added for the first time last year as well. So this is all quite new stuff that we've, we're actually doing this work. And across the ambulance services, there was no consistency. So we had projects like mine going on in one area, but nothing in other areas or completely different projects. No one learning from each other. So I went to the Association of Ambulance Chief Execs last year and requested a national group to be set up to manage end-of-life care across the country, to which they agreed, but then told me that I was chairing, which was lovely. So a little bit about what I've been doing in the ambulance service in CCAM for the last few years. So we'll go through these one by one in a second. First of all, uh, the first year, we focused on education, integration, and information sharing. We wanted to increase the understanding of end-of-life care in the ambulance clinician population, and also really poignantly increase the understanding of professional roles across the system. So that for me is the role of the hospice, knowing the role of the hospice as an ambulance clinician, but also teaching the hospices about what paramedics and other ambulance clinicians, because there are lots of different types, will do for your patient and can do for your patient. So I worked with community teams, hospice teams, and within the ambulance service. I uh, worked with um, these community teams about, around information sharing, and some of them are here today, and we work brilliantly in terms of sharing information about patients so that at the point of call, we can keep those people at home where it is appropriate and possible. In the second year, we continue to be part-funded, by the sequin, but we also were pretty much seen as business as usual in the ambulance service, which was great. Um, we, working with all of the hospices across the area, have really good um, commun communication with them and had taught, have now taught over 800 of our frontline staff. The majority did this in their own time because we don't allow for CPD hours for the majority. All of our critical care specialists, so all of our critical care paramedics, have had education one to pretty much four to one with me. And that's because they're the ones who are going out to the critically unwell people who present to us, which are a lot of our end-of-life care patients from the initial informa information that we get. I also work with all five of the universities in our patch and all new paramedics entering into the trust. 
We've taught several hundred community teams and hospice teams about the ambulance service, which is always a really fun time because I get to show them some of the amazing jobs that we get in, like broken fingers and things like that. We also support the CCGs in things like education pathways, um, direct admissions programs and end of life care hubs to support ambulance clinicians to keep people out of hospital. So, oh I didn't do that. So in this last year, so since April, we also decided that the best way to make this change, because it is a change program, was to have somebody who could actually learn the theory of it. And we decided to recruit a Darcy Fellow in healthcare leadership. And they ran a project at the same time as learning about end of at the same time as um, learning about change management and things like that in London. So I basically put my own job up for advert. <laughs> which I then competed for with a load of doctors, which is a good idea. But I'm still here, so I got it. <laughs> um, so I'm now, my, my aim is to make this a more sustainable project because local support for me is so important. At the moment, 3,000 staff come to me when they're worried about things with end-of-life care. They will come to me and ask questions, ask for support, and... That isn't sustainable for one person, believe me. So moving towards a sort of community of practice for our critical care paramedics to be able to support those staff and feed into me and receive further inf like education themselves is so, <coughs> is so important. I also want to explore and expand the knowledge around paramedics and end-of-life care because I said before there's not that much research. So I'm doing a small qualitative project to understand the factors that affect a paramedic's decision making. And that's just paramedics, that's not all ambulance clinicians, just because it would just cause too much confusion. There are also well-documented cultural issues in the ambulance service. Bullying and harassment are rife, and there's a militaristic culture which can be quite hard to live with. Um, because end-of-life care is such a key area of concern for paramedics, I want to explore how this culture could be improved. And I'm thinking about things like Schwartz rounds and other ways of connecting people um, to break down barriers in the ambulance service. So, you get an ambulance in there. Um, thank you very much for having me. And thanks for the people that I know here that are here to support me. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Shamila. And, and we will come back for questions at the end. Um, what an enormous amount of work over a very short period of time. Very, very impressive. Um, I'd like, next like to introduce Dr. Kirsten Moore. She's a senior research fellow at Marie Curie Palliative Care Research Department at University College London. And we move to the field of dementia. Kirsten's going to talk about the compassion intervention for people with dementia. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the leaders of the program who um, developed it, um, Dr. Louise Jones and Dr. Liz Sampson, and also the funders, Marie Curie. So we are well aware of dementia and the growing issue of dementia in, in society. We now have around 850,000 people living in the UK with dementia, and that's growing. And the 670,000 family carers are only the primary carers that are providing a, a great deal of support to, to people with dementia. And there's a lot of other people that are also supporting people with dementia. The costs are £26.3 billion, pounds, and that's higher, um, that's social and healthcare costs, higher than cancer, heart disease or stroke. And one in three people over the age of 65 will now die with dementia. Yet we still have a real lack of emphasis on palliative on a palliative approach in dementia care. And so I think some of the challenges around that are the sort of so the challenges that dementia pose in palliative care is the lack of capacity um, to make informed decision making at the end of life for people with dementia. And often the belief that dementia is not a terminal condition. Even, even when we speak to staff in memory services, they're still telling us that 
it's not really um, a terminal, it doesn't, it doesn't cause your death, it's a um, mental health condition. So we're still challenging, we're still sort of faced with those barriers. We also have a poor access to health and palliative care expertise in care homes. And there's also a long and uncertain trajectory with comorbidities common. So there's not really a clear point when someone is at the end of life necessarily. So it can be very difficult to um, apply end of life care principles. But we have recently had the um, publication of the European Association of Palliative Care's um, white paper to, to guide optimal care in, in dementia and end of life care. So we can see from this um, figure from deaths um, from five leading causes in 2016 that dementia and Alzheimer's disease is now the highest cause of death. And you can see also that the blue bars showing that, um, representing women, that um, a lot more women are dying from dementia than, than men. Um, and also the place of death for people with dementia um, is predominantly in the care home setting where there is um, probably less access access to palliative care expertise. Also a large number are dying in hospital and a much smaller no number dying at home. A very tiny little yellow um, slit of people living in other settings such as hospice settings. So this led to the Compassion Program um, 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 to look at sort of having th three main aims to understand the clinical needs of people with dementia towards the end of life and those close to them. And we did a cohort study looking at um, following people over um, doing monthly assessments over a nine month period and also um, their family carers um, either till the point where they died or um, up to nine months. And that, that paper has um, just recently been published when, and, and showed that there's a lot of unmet symptoms and chronic pain and um, behavioural and psychological symptoms all the way through those last months of life. And also very limited access to um, palliative care and psychiatric expertise. The second aim was to develop a complex intervention to improve care for people with advanced dementia. And the third was to test that for feasibility and acceptability. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. It was a very detailed development of this complex intervention. So I'll, I'll very briefly um, talk about, you know, it involved literature review. We did workshops across the UK. We had input from family carers, people with dementia, people with the early stages of dementia and people working in um, palliative care, care home settings and, and, and end of life and dementia care. We brought that, we used the um, RAND appropriateness method, which looks at um, ranking statements for appropriateness and necessity in an in a intervention, and we operationalised that into a manual. The core components which, of which were integrated multidisciplinary care and education, training and support for formal and informal family carers. So the key, key driver to that program was an interdisciplinary care leader, and that's where I was brought on, brought in, was involved in the study. Um, the requirements of, a, of this role was that the person had to have knowledge of dementia and end-of-life care. They were able to undertake observational assessments, such as pain, depression and behavioural symptoms. But they were able to engage with healthcare professionals as well as the family carers, um, and have a, a range of skills such as teaching, counselling. Um, but pretty important was having good clinical support um, for that role as well. I think initially they were expecting that it would be a, a nurse or a palliative care nurse that would be ta um, that they'd engage, um, but I have a psychology and social science and clinical dementia care research background, so that's um, probably may have influenced and have a, an imp impact on how that how this was implemented. And just briefly describing the the model of care, the sort of three components that sort of lead into one. So the interdisciplinary care leader does an a holistic assessment of, the, of a resident with advanced dementia. And that involves reviewing their existing care plans. And as I think the, um, Sharon mentioned that, you know, people having sort of 13, 15, 20 care plans. Um, I think one of the care homes had 100 templates or more of, of different things that, um, different care plans. So I'd review those notes, I'd, do a, um, I'd sit with a resident, I'd have to talk to them if they were able to communicate verbally, um, I'd do observational assessments, I'd talk to the family, I'd talk to the care staff, and I'd look at sort of some of the issues and whether they had any existing advanced care plan or any um, end of life care issues um, that we needed to look at. Then aim to meet with the um, nurse, in, nurse responsible for the care of that resident and the GP, and discuss that um, assessment and agree to a, a care plan and see if there's anything, un, any unmet needs. So this obviously wasn't just about end of life 
the, the final days or weeks of life. It was about their current, end of, current care needs as well. And then if we weren't able to address in the still ongoing unmet needs, the, the aim was to sort of then address that at a multidisciplinary team meeting that would occur on a monthly basis and would bring outside expertise from palliative care, um, psychiatric care. Um, we also had a geriatrician involved. And underpinning, um, underlying this sort of model, the role, um, the ICL was also to provide staff with training um, and also information and support to family carers or to bring in other pe people with the right expertise to provide that training if needed. So I worked in two London nursing homes in different um, clinical commissioning groups. Um, unfortunately, it was a very short intervention of only six months um, at a cost of 18,000 18, for that half, -time, half, half a year for a full-time position. Um, and we, inco we included residents who were with advanced stages of dementia and I've got the functional assessment staging um, that we used. And basically someone 6A, 6A plus just means that they're likely to have problems with incontinence, getting to the point where they might be bed bound, have, having reduced communication, verbal communication, um, and sort of getting into those more advanced stages of dementia. But I, I have to say that, you know, I think, I don't think it has to be for just people with advanced dementia. I think we're looking at how, you know, these principles would apply throughout um, dementia care. And one of the other key things was that it was a naturalistic study in that we were able to adapt the model to the local context. We knew that care homes are so different in the way they operate, their staffing, their capacity, that we had to be able to be flexible to, to respond to that um, diversity. We did quite a lot of evaluation. Um, I kept a, a reflective diary and a time log. We collected process data. And we also had other researchers that tried to recruit residents to, to um, undertake the same assessments that we'd done in the earlier cohort study to make sure that the intervention wasn't causing any harm. This is a feasibility study, so it wasn't about testing the outcomes of the intervention. We also did a lot of interviews with um, healthcare professionals that were coming into the care home as well as staff in the care home um, and some of the family carers as well. I could do a whole pr presentation and go on quite a lot about the, the different contexts of the two, two nursing homes um, as they were quite different and that meant that we were able to implement the intervention in quite a different way. Um, at both care homes though they did have a um, one GP clinic that they that all of their residents were um, engaged with, so that meant we only had to work with sort of one GP coming into the care home. Um, at, one, at nursing home two, however, that, that GP didn't feel like they had capacity to really um, attend these meetings, so we decided to just um, involve her if there was a specific medical medication issue that she needed to address, but we generally just, um, I just met with the nursing home manager and nurses. Also at Nursing Home 2, we weren't able to establish a multidisciplinary team because there just wasn't any external support that we could, could bring into the um, nursing home. We did ev eventually sort of manage to get the hospice, um, so, um, someone from the hospice come to the care home and, and talk about where, um, try, try and improve the relationship there so that um, they knew what resources the hospice might be able to, to offer and when they might be call, suitable to call on um, within that nursing home. But in the other nursing home, we were able to have um, regular multidisciplinary team meetings and regular meetings with the GP. Um, and that, that particularly was helped with a, a geriatrician who was very engaged at one of the local hospitals. So in terms of outcomes, in the first nursing home where we had the, um, more, the multidisciplinary team meetings, the, the main thing we did was sort of reduce a lot of the advanced care, end of life care, future wishes documents which they had about four different templates for. We reduced that into one and, and tried to make that more of a proactive one. So rather than just saying they're for or not for hospital and they're for or not for resuscitation, which we wanted to sort of have um, the GP more involved in sort of thinking about what might happen, what are some of the complications or symptoms this, this person might have and how could the care home manage that and when should they um, call an ambulance and, and, and sort of have a more of a more, more specific guidelines to help them um, guide their care. And that's now being, they've, they've now rolled that out across the CCG. In the other nursing home, as I said, the, the resources were very different and what we were able to, to implement was very different. But we did identify in an audit as part of the um, intervention that of the 77 residents, only one had a pain management plan um, and, and 
and basically a lot of the residents who had advanced dementia or weren't able to communicate, that they had no way of assessing pain or, or even considering pain. So we got them using the pain ad, which is an observational tool, which at least gets them thinking about and thinking, well, maybe this person is in pain. Have we thought about that? Have we tried to um, implement a pain management plan? So that, I think, was a really major outcome at this care home. They're also really thrilled with the idea of we introduced these um, modifiable wall-mounted care charts, which just had key information about the person, so that because often you get changes in healthcare assistance, um, you might have staff that don't know the, the resident very well, they have key information on those sheets so that they could see that at a glance and come in. Um, and as the manager says in this quote, that it's the relatives that really like them the most because they get to tell you and about their loved one and they can make sure that the staff know about them. And they also felt that the Care Quality Commission felt um, they really liked the This Is Me profiles. I think one of the key things of the whole role was the engagement with family carers. And we, we published this paper around sort of the, the issues around having end-of-life conversations. Part of my role was to sit down with a family carer and sort of say, well, what's happening for you? How are you... How, what do you think is happening with the care for your relative? What do you think, you know, end of life might be and, and, and might look like? And, and do you want to have a discussion about that? And have you had a discussion about that? And quite surprisingly, just considering they've been looking after someone in a living in a care home with advanced dementia, all, nobody said that they'd had a conversation previously. Um, and all of them said they did want to have... All except for one, I think, did want to have a conversation. So I think... And then when we started having those conversations, and we also, both of the managers also asked me to have um, sort of some care education groups with, with family carers, that the lack of understanding about dementia was really, um, so just sort of understanding what dementia was, let alone how it might progress and what might end of life look like, um, showed how much work we sort of need to, to do in this area. But some of the other strategies we sort of identified for improving practice around end of life um, information for family carers was also appreciating the value of in-depth end-of-life conversations and discussions. Um, often we found that the staff talk, talked about it in a very task-oriented way. We need a DNR signed. And, you know, I'd go and have a conversation. I mean, an example that comes to mind is, is talking to a son who's, whose mum was in her early 60s um, in the care home and um, he'd never considered that she has a condition that might be life-shortening. And I had a discussion with him and, you know, I, I wasn't there saying, do you want to sign this DNI form? Because he, he said, oh, I'm going to have, go and have a talk with my, my sister and things like that. And the nurse said to me, why hasn't he signed the form? And I'm like, well, he's not, he's not at that point yet. He's, it's the first time anyone's ever talked to this about him. And, and he's, it's, it's a, it, you know, it, it wasn't, we weren't at that point. Um, and, a, and a few days later, his mum died. And I, I thought, well, if... You know that that would have been such a shock shock for him without any discussion, and so that preparation for end of life is is not really happening. Um, so sort of emphasising the importance of sort of the having time and space for sensitive discussions, and and within the often rushed atmosphere in the care home, there's not always the space for those conversations. And we did have we did interview the GP who who felt they didn't have time to be involved in this in the um, core meetings with us, or with and that she reflected that she doesn't have time to have these conversations with family carers, but she really does see that she needs to start having those conversations. So she was looking at whether she could increase her sessions from you know, half a day a week to having a whole day a week um, dedicated to that care home. So just in wrapping up, it was a very short-term implementation to, to try and do practice change, try and integrate care, and um, I think that's a massive barrier to, to doing this sort of work because it does take probably two years to make practice change sort of start to happen. Um, I think what was really in interesting is that I know that there's been a lot of programs around um, sort of training programs on end-of-life care and dementia in care homes. And it, it wasn't the training that, that was helpful. I mean, I did do a lot of training, but I don't think that really engaged the staff in terms in, com in comparison to the hol holistic assessment sit sitting down with the nurse and the GP and them going, gee, we never realised that when we're actually just reviewing the care plan month by month, just saying same as before, same as before, but we're not actually seeing the person, we're not actually really reviewing that person. So um, sort of having that more in-depth assessment at that point was helped them to identify and, and, and realise some of the gaps in, in care that were there. Um, in Nursing Home 1, we had um, the structure enabled greater implementation according to the model of care. 
Um, but despite that, we were still able to make some fairly important changes at Nursing Home too as well. So we've, we feel that the model is feasible, um, mainly because it is so adaptable and, and responding to the no local context. It does raise, of course, like most research, more questions than it answers. We, we need to look at whether or not there is, is actually out, benef beneficial outcomes for residents and family, and where this sort of role could sit, who would fund it, does it sit within community mental health, does it sit in palliative care, um, does a person need to be employed by the care home, um, there certainly was a lot of input that the external, being external to the care home meant that family carers felt that they could talk to me more easily because they didn't feel like um, I was on the side of the care home. So I think there was some importance in, in having that role a little bit external. But I also had external healthcare professionals saying, what's it really like in the care home? You know, we come in and, and the, the resident's been all plumped up and looks all lovely, and, and, but we don't see what really happens under, underneath when we, when we walk out the door. So it was kind of a bit of a, um, a role in between that sort of had pros and cons, I guess. Interesting regarding what sort of discipline. Um, I'm coming more from a social background. I think that sort of added something that the nursing and medical staff weren't thinking about so much in terms of quality of care, things like having music and then um, having things that improve quality of life and comfort. Um, but, you know, obviously it could be from a range of different sort of um, disciplines. How intense does the role need to be, to be? I work with two care homes, but you know, how feasible would it be to work with more care homes? Um, and does that need to be as intense ongoing? Or once you start to upskill the staff in the care homes, can, can they sort of start to take on um, sort of those roles of discussing, having discussions with families and that more internally? Um, then we've got quite a few publications from, from this study. The, um, BMJ Open One reports sort of look on the actual implementation of the intervention, and you can access the, the manual is freely available on the um, Marie Curie Palliative Care Research um, website. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Kirsten. Um, fascinating project. Um, our next and final speaker is Professor Bridget Johnson. She's a Florence Nightingale Foundation Professor of Clinical Nursing Practice Research at the University of Glasgow and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And um, just to continue the conversation about in integration. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things to help round us off, to really help provoke um, some discussion, but also give you some information about what's happening in terms of integration of palliative end of life care in Scotland. Um, just, just to actually just see your faces, but how many people here are from, in the audience here are from Scotland? So a few people will, will know, but, but perhaps the people outside Scotland won't know. But just before we do that, just to draw on some data um, for a project that I did, evaluating the Macmillan Specialist Care at Home model. How many people here know about Macmillan Specialist Care at Home? A few people. Macmillan Specialist Care at Home is one example of a care at home model of palliative care um, and the, the, the project, the has been, intervention has been rolled out across England um, and my job with the team that I was working at at the, with, at the University of Nottingham was to evaluate the model. Um, our data, just briefly, because like, we can't go into, you know, we did a massive amount of data because we, we had data from, you can see, 3,286 patients from the six sites. Our two publications um, will hopefully be out by the end of this year, um, one a findings paper and one a particularly around the interviews that we did um, with patients, volunteers and family members. And the report will be on the, the Macmillan website, which I screenshotted just before. Um, just a little bit about what we found about integration in that, this big evaluation. So all in all, just to give you a bit of a flavour rather than just jump just to the bit about integration, um, we did a mixed methods evaluation across the six sites. The six sites, the furthest north was Hull, the furthest south at the Isle, the Isle of Wight, and the sites were really quite different. Um, so, so the programme was about establishing sustainable and affordable palliative care in the community with these four 
broad principles about patterns of early referral. In some ways, that was the hardest thing to evaluate, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, about delivering clinical interventions at the home, so again, keeping people at home for um, as long as possible. Um, and ensuring coordinated care. So this is the bit that, that was particularly interesting about um, integration, about the coordinated care um, between the service providers, but also about encouraging this flexible teamwork um, with both, and I don't know if I like the term specialist and generalist, but anyway, that's a whole other um, discussion but in terms of the people um, who are working with patients, but also the role of volunteers. Um, as you'll know, that's particularly, you know, hospice movement probably does volunteers better than any other um, area or sector in, in the UK. But we, get, we, we had, um, our evaluation had data from staff, from patients, from family members, um, and from the volunteers and key stakeholders around those sites. So just a little tiny bit about what we found about integration. Interestingly, um, the sites where teams were housed together achieved the greater number of home, home deaths. So that was where, 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 where the sort of offices, if you like, were in the same place as well as uh, working was particularly good. And sort of following on from that, the teamwork aspect um, allowed integration to work best. So that was the overlap between, the, particularly between the Macmillan team and the current community staff um, and, and this sort of model of joint education and training were particularly important not about the training bit interestingly what we were hearing from Kirsten but it was about that joint working and, and relationship um, building between the teams so just if we move over just one quote from our, our big data set um, so this was just from one of the staff in one of the focus groups um, that we did. We did focus groups, we did longitudinal data across the two years of our evaluation. Um, and this was just from one of the focus groups um, at our final uh, point of data collection. Um, we all contribute, we all deliver to the same programme, and we've got champions in every area. I'm a great fan of having champions to, to, in all sorts of areas um, to help staff. Um, they've got the, the same end-of-life care competencies, so it's again, you know, this joint training. Um, if they work in different settings, they're mentored by different disciplines. They will know the common goal of what those competencies are. And for the patient moving through, the staff have had the same education. So just that importance of everybody working together. So just before we go on to the question bit, a bit about what we're doing in Scotland in terms of integration. So in, in Scotland, um, our end-of-life care strategy is called the Strategic Framework for Action um, for Palliative and End-of-Life Care. Um, came out in December 2015, so this is the, the strategy that we're working at at the moment. We have a number of commitments in our strategy, and one of the commitments, commitment one, was about supporting Healthcare Improvement Scotland to provide health and social care partnerships in Scotland with expertise in testing and implementing improvements um, about palliative and end-of-life care and that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about now. So our health and so, so the, the area where I work in Greater Glasgow and Clyde we're the biggest health board area in Scotland and we have six healthcare and, and social care partnerships just in our area. Um, in terms of what the Scottish Government palliative care work is doing, that we have six improvement um, hubs across the whole of Scotland, and one in my area is one of the palliative and end-of-life care improvement hubs, which is Glasgow City. So this is just a screenshot from, our, from the HIS Healthcare Improvement so, um, site website um, talking about what we're doing specifically around palliative and end-of-life care. So the improvement hubs, as, I, as I've said, Glasgow City is one of them. The other ones are Fife, Dundee, Perth and Kinross, East Ayrshire and the Western Lives. So you can see how much of the sort of geography of, of Scotland the, the improvement hubs cover. And our health and social care partnerships um, are going to be different to England and in, in, in the rest of the UK, partly because of the geography of Scotland. You know, Scotland um, you, does healthcare slightly differently 
uh, perhaps not surprisingly, to the, the rest of the UK, um, and how we work our integration is slightly different. But of course, our geography is very different in, in terms of vast areas. Um, you know, we, we have ur urban areas, but our vast rural areas are quite different to the rest of the, of the UK, particularly our island populations. And so that's why it's quite exciting that one of our improvement hubs is the Western Isles. So just about a little bit about specifically what Glasgow City are doing. Um, so each, so the Scottish Government have funded these improvement hubs um, and each hub, um, so each of the sites that you've just seen um, has appointed an improvement advisor. They all started slightly different times, but they've all started within the last six months. So work is at, at very sort of early stages. But what Glasgow City have done with this lovely complicated diagram here is map palliative care just in our Glasgow city area. So in, the, in, in my area that I cover in the uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, we have six hospices, but just in Glasgow city, we have two, Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice and Marie Curie Glasgow. So this is just a map of Glasgow city in terms of palliative care. So it just goes to show you just how complex integration of health and social care in relation to palliative and end of life care can be. And I quite like this angle. I don't think this is as complex as it perhaps should have been. I think that this actually, I mean, this is freely available on, on the um, Improvement Hub and the Glasgow City website. But in terms of, um, you know, it, it, it could be an awful lot more complicated than, than, than it is here. So I think well done to, to, to the Glasgow City um, HSCP people for, for developing this. Um, so just this is a little bit busy, but it just gives you the, the idea of what Glasgow City are trying to do with their integration and improvement. So, you know, they're, they're not surprisingly, they're saying that their vision is, is, match, is mapping um, on the Scottish, our, our end of life care strategy, our strategic framework for action. Um, and that, that, that and, and our strategic framework for action is saying, it's a bit bold really, but it's saying that by 2021, everybody in Scotland, they've said Glasgow, who needs palliative care will have access to it, regardless of age, diagnosis or circumstance. As an academic, I'm thinking how we're measuring that, but anyway, um, and that the care provided will be safe, effective and person-centred. So, and because this is an improvement hub, we actually have to prove um, that, 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 that this is, is actually happening. And I quite like this one because I work in this area, but Glasgow will be a place where people die well, um, supported through bereavement, um, uh, through bereavement and communities and individuals are able to help each other. And actually, in, in Glasgow, we're one of the, uh, in part of Greater Glasgow, in more the Clyde area, we're one of the only areas that's designated a compassionate community. Um, so some people will know about the work that's happening in Inverclyde around compassionate communities. So um, although that doesn't actually fall into Glasgow city area, um, you know, there, there is absolutely <coughs> this um, notion of, of community working. So I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but you know, just some of the things that the Improvement Hub's trying to do in Glasgow, um, related particularly, you know, a theme of the conference very much around advanced care planning. Um, that's absolutely going to be part and parcel of the work. Um, our Improvement Hub in Glasgow is also going to do quite a bit of work with care homes. Again, you know, vast urban population, vast aging population in um, Glasgow City, um, and we have a large number of care homes within that area. Um, and what uh, Sharon, who's the, the improvement advisor, is going to work with the care homes, particularly the care homes which are under the control of the council, because they've got the most in, in the HSCP, they've got most control over those, is to look, help them identify people with palliative care needs as part of their population. Um, also doing work with dementia because of the dementia strategy that we also have in Scotland as well. So I want to, so the point of, of my roundup, if you like, is not just to give you the, the, the picture from Scotland and Glasgow, is to make, help you think about what sort of questions you might ask. And I want you to think particularly around this question in the questions you might want to ask um, us in, in this sort of discussion session. So thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much to you all, and thank you, Bridget, for posing the, the f final and first question. I don't know whether we can spin back for that, can we? Does it come? Not. No. <laughs> what, what do you perceive to be the questions? Hi, I'm Claire Russell. I am Head of Transformation at St. Gemma's Hospice in Leeds. Um, I suppose my job really is about transforming and integrating and looking what new services we're going to build and what our next strategy is going to look like. And I feel I'm just really interested, Sharon, in the comments that you made, really inspirational talk. But one of the biggest barriers that we come, well, I see that we'll come against is, you know, we've got great ideas about how we work differently, how we Pull together, Leeds is a very innovative city in the fact we've got a managed clinical network for palliative and end-of-life care. We're very fortunate to have that in place. And although it's in its infancy, you can see that's making a real difference. But I think we still come against the barrier of true integration from a hospice perspective because there's always the take of how will that affect our brand, how will that affect our income in terms of the charitable funds that we bring in. I'm just interested in your thoughts around that. Okay, thank you. It's quite an easy one, is it not? Um, I suppose I would say to anybody, anything that's about change and transformation is about, about finding your common ground first. So whether that's um, getting together the, the teams, understanding what you've got in common and work from a strength-based perspective. We often work from a deficit base and about from um, a perception of um, protectionism and you know sort of you mentioned about obviously you worried about brand about worried about resources which immediately makes me think does that think does that immediately sort of and i if i'm going into the wrong territory tell me but it makes me think does uh, that mean that care homes are immediately um perceived as negative places and i think they are there's nods in the room and i think you know that we have we use the language i've heard it a lot and it's language shapes behavior around you know i don't want to end up in a care home and actually there are many care homes we've got the whole spectrum um, we've got many home care homes that are doing amazing innovative work and are really doing uh, changing the lives of people for the positive we've still got homes in the sector that are not performing well across the piece and I think you know and everything in between but I think all those that are doing well need sustaining and those that aren't doing well need to be enabled to to reach their potential and if they can't perhaps they shouldn't be operating dare I say um, hospices do enjoy that that occupy that space of being held in high esteem and it's something that um, care homes aspire to but I think it's about starting from a strength base and seeing what's in common and also seeing what you can add to each other. Because I think, I think care homes, and I, I take on board the comments around dementia earlier by my colleagues, but you know, many care homes actually do the person-centred bit and the relationship bit really well. What they've dropped off over the years, perhaps, in some cases, is not being as um, adept at really embracing all the clinical changes that are happening and haven't stayed abreast of that. But, so what you bring to that is a real strength base. But I think it's how you start the conversation from a different place and... and that question about what matters to you, I'd, I'd say that there's a lot more in common about what matters to all of us than what disconnects us. I don't know if that's helpful or it's got to the heart, but I think it's about starting that conversation and I think we're, we're, it's easier to start it from a positive place about the commonalities. Another question? Um, thank you very much for the presentations. I'm Kate Tompkins. I'm chair of Dorothy House Hospice in Wiltshire. Um, having worked in the community many moons ago, I know that integration is often based on good relationships, um, learning by working together, and also sharing a common purpose. And I wondered if I could be slightly provocative and say to the panel, are the barriers to this organisational boundaries, financial and uh, budgets and politically driven restructures. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think, can I, can yeah, I think there's an opportunity in care homes, because that's obviously what, what I know well. We've got regulated activities which um, 
put care homes into a care home without, with nursing and a care home without nursing. And there are only, in England, there are only just over 4,000 care homes with nursing. And then that, there's about 12,500 without nursing. Everybody who lives in a care home, I would argue, needs access to a registered nurse. Mm -hmm. But it's who provides it. And because of that regulated activity that puts those boundaries in place, you either get district nurses coming into care homes without, and then or you get a nurse in situ employed by the, um, by the, the care home provider, operator. Actually, if we wanted to do something differently, and given the workforce challenges, I wonder if we didn't have those regulated activities. And as is in the legislation in England from the Care Quality Commission, it does tell providers that you have to evidence how you meet the assessed needs of people by providing the appropriate and safe staffing. Wouldn't it be radical, or perhaps not, if we didn't have those regulated activities and if locally you could say, well, how can we use our workforce differently? Now, there's always those, then those fears because of the perception of what care homes do and the bad people that they wouldn't put the appropriate staffing in. But actually, there are some people in care homes residential that don't need lots of nursing. Then we've got through to the spectrum in care homes with nursing that they need immense amounts of nursing. But actually, if we looked at how we would provide that locally and use our workforce collectively locally to provide that in a better way, I think we could get some innovation, innovative solutions. So yes, there's some barriers because of some regulated activities. I think it's interesting. I was a Florence Nightingale scholar last year and I looked at integration and I went to the devolved administrations and I looked at whether having legislation for integration in Scotland, in uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, we don't have it in England, whether it was an enabler or a disabler and somebody said to me, for those that wanted to get on and do it, they did it anyway, they were ahead of the curve. For those that actually needed the legislation, they waited it for it to come and now they're getting on and they're thriving. And then there was that cohort, and still that cohort, that whatever you do, they need to be dragged kicking and screaming. And so, you know, I just think it is about relationships. It's about unlocking that potential and having the conversation. But we have to circumvent the systems that are there and make them work more effectively or press for the change. And it's not one, or rather it's lots of things in tandem. I don't know if my colleagues would support that. Yeah, I, would, I was just going to say that as a trust that covers... The, the massive area that, that we do, um, we, we see this, we, I sit in, try, try and sit in 22 CCG end of life care boards, um, which you can imagine I don't get to all of most of the time. And we deal with the sort of conflicting values and, and what the different programs that everyone is working on. And it's, it, if we're not even learning in the same sector across each area, then within each even profession, how does that happen? Um, and we see where it fails in the ambulance service because we fill the gaps um, when that care has failed. We're the ones that end up there trying to keep people at hospital and get them good, as good deaths as we can um, on our own when this fails around other patients. Can I just reiterate what, what Sharon is saying? From, obviously, from a nurse, I'm going to champion nursing, but I totally agree that... I mean, I think there is something about the, 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 the care home sector that we need to do, if you like, a marketing model, mm. um, that, that I, I want to see more young nurses want to work mm. in, in older people's care and to see it as a, as a particularly important area to work. But I totally agree that our elderly people who are in care homes deserve to have care... Um, even if it's overseen by a registered nurse for those people who need less. And, and I think that, that the problem with resourcing is that that world is changing. Um, and I know there's discussions on in Scotland at the moment about um, making sure that we keep um, a registered nurse in, in care homes. So I worry about that, that in terms of resourcing because I think we will get a situation where if you've got a care home where there is no nurse, you're going to get a lot more 999 yeah. or whatever calls and people being, tra being inappropriately moved from a care home um, to hospital. Sometimes, obviously, it's totally appropriate, but it is inappropriate in, in, in uh, many times uh, at the end of life. So I worry about that, and I do think that we have a job in palliative and end-of-life care to help promote care home care as something... Um, where people should want to work um, mm -hmm. and not, not be seen as a sort of secondary service. Mm -hmm. And certainly the funding issue, um, 
there's a really one of I work for the, the organization I work for is an umbrella body for the not-for-profit care sector so it's care homes home care the whole gambit and one of our members um, based in Cheshire they've created new villages and they've won awards and they're doing some really exciting innovative work and they've got care homes as part of those villages and they've they've been working locally to create a um, a nurse lead um, in each uh, care home and they work in households but there's not a nurse on each unit and they've it's like an internal matron I know I'm using old language, but sort of role, community matron who has a caseload but works. Funding gets in the way. Funding gets in the way because the district nurses still have to come in and see those that are funded through the local authority because they are uh, residential. They're not deemed uh, nursing. Or those that um, don't get part funding, not continuing health care, but part funding from health. So the, the, those that get nursing funding can access the registered nurse on site. Now they are working locally to say, come on, this is, this is a false economy here. This is not a good use of resources. Can we, with the CCG, with the local authority, with the GPs, can we get together? We will upskill. We have more nurses on that are more specialists that can cover the whole home, and they haven't reduced the registered nurse, but they've also upskilled uh, care staff and at different levels, participating in nurse associates and, and different ways of working, then using specialist input. So they are really trying, but having to get people together to say, can we just do something different? I know the legislation doesn't strictly allow it, but can we do something? Can we be at the forefront of that thinking? Because it, it makes a farce when you've got nurses on site, but you've got to wait for a district nurse to come in. And, you know, they could be using their time better. And it's not, want, not wanting their expertise. It's just, could we do things differently? Mm -hmm. So there are people trying to push the boundaries, but some of these barriers that you mentioned are in place. And the, the relationships, I think, um, are really, really critical. And I, I'm, it draws, I think of the example where the, the care home just felt like the hospital just had so little trust for the care that they provided, that they got to the point where they were taking photos of residents' skin and possible areas of pressure sores before they went into hospital because they knew that they'd come out of hospital with a pressure ulcer and then be blamed that they went in with, the in with that precious pressure ulcer. So, you know, that sort of the, the breakdown and the lack of trust and, and, and it f it, it's so negative and it's, it's just it's an awful kind of the negativity there is, is so such a big gap and and I think it also feeds into the confidence of the health of the staff in the care homes that that felt feel like they don't have the skills and the capacity to do a lot of things that they do have the skills for but um, we'll we'll ring the ambulance send them to hospital because they've been told time and time again that they don't have those skills um, so I just think sort of better relationships between um, the settings is, is a way forward difficult here in the front. Hi, um, I'm Debbie Tolbert. I'm from um, Birmingham St Mary's Hospice. My question is um, for Shamila. Well, first of all, uh, a comment really. Um, um, I'm quite staggered to hear about um, your colleagues in the ambulance service not actually having dedicated CPD time. That's a real eye-opener for me. Um, and it also goes quite a long way to helping to understand perhaps one of the challenges and barriers that we've had to engaging with the ambulance service in the past, because hospices will often use education as a way of engaging uh, you know, workforce in other sectors. Um, and I don't think we're very good at really understanding each other's pressures um, uh, um, and sort of education for us for the other sectors is a way through that. So my question for you really is when we're sort of trying to look at integrating models of care um, for end of life um, and we're wanting to engage our local ambulance services, um, how do we do that, particularly if we're not lucky to have somebody like yourself in post in our regions? Um, and um, how do we encourage um, your colleagues to want to know and learn more about um, innovation in end-of-life care and how um, we are trying to change and move things? 
So, um, every, so all of the ambulance services do have somebody designated to um, lead on end-of-life care. I am one of two which is full-time. Um, so actually, the majority of people do it as part of a sort of clinical development type role, generally. Um, we don't get CPD time apart from some of the specialists, so in, certainly in my area. So I get eight hours every 10 weeks, um, but it's not sort of structured what I do with that time. Um, but the general sort of paramedics and any other ambulance clinicians do any sort of CPD in their own time. Um, it hasn't been hard for me to get people to do it in their own time. Um, like I said, there's 800 people of the 3,000 who have been really, they've showed so much interest and been so grateful for the opportunity to learn. And generally, I think it's that they don't know what is available because there isn't a focus on education in the ambulance services and there hasn't been um, because, you know, I showed you that the programme around end-of-life care has only really been the last couple of years. Um, so I think in terms of encouraging, it's encouraging them to go. I think it's about making sure they know it's happening because if they know, they will go. They will turn up in their own time and because this is probably one of the biggest areas that makes them fearful about making decisions and managing patients effectively because we all watch people die who could die better and you know I've done that for years for years and I qualified when I was 21 and when you're a 21 year old paramedic and you're working on your own because we don't have a structure like doctors do or even nurses do you're on your first day um, now it's probably a year but on your first day when I started you were out on your own as a full paramedic on your own and I went to double fatal car accident on my first day <laughs> age 21 with a brand new support worker so if you give people the options and they know about it they will they will go I think that also is an important point um, when we we're talking earlier about nurses wanting to be engaged in in aged care I think mm -hmm. um, from what I understand is that you know when they do do a placement or if they go into a care home they don't get a lot of support and, and they may never have met a person with dementia and and they they're not really given much support in in how to deal with that and how to understand that and I think mm. just that sort of better support yeah. for in in aged care um, to understand dementia and, and so yeah. those issues might be and the focus is very much emergency based you know the work that we do is so focused on sort of life saving and and you know I gave the example earlier um, and I've never I was never in my original degree taught on end of life care but I never delivered a baby before I delivered one on my own either. Um, and I've delivered three, and one was shoulder dystocia. So, you know, it's, it, it's incredible what we're asking these people to do. And I think we can only just try and support them with everything, really. OK. So a massive thank you to Sharon and Shamila and Kirsten and Bridget for joining us today and for that wonderful broad spectrum of, of, of care across so many different parts of our community. And a big thank you to all of you for joining us.